Hello, Dr. John Cavanaugh, and welcome to Lesson 6 of AJS 101, Introduction to Criminal Justice. This chapter is about the police personality, police corruption, danger in police work, civil liability, recruitment and selection standards, and the role of private security in the criminal justice area. Let's begin by talking about the police subculture. Now, you can't understand what a subculture is unless you know what a culture is. That's kind of anthropology. So a culture consists of the beliefs, values, and accepted behaviors of a group. And one culture usually dominates a particular society. There is an American culture, uh, which tends to uh, value individualism. Um, it tends to value free thinking. It, it's kind of lighthearted. It isn't like super serious, a free enterprise, uh, uh, a certain amount of deference to religion. Uh, these are the American subculture, which is very different from other subcultures, uh, especially some subcultures in Asia like China or, or perhaps uh, South America or uh, Arab countries. So the shared beliefs and uh, the accepted behaviors uh, these are all, and the values, these are all the culture of a society. And again, one culture usually dominates a particular society. Now, a subculture is a culture that exists in a society which is different from the dominant culture. Now, many immigrant groups form their own subcultures, and some criminal gangs also have their own subcultures. For example, when immigrants come to this country from overseas, they usually don't integrate right into the general American society. They very often uh, create neighborhoods where they all live and work together. Uh, the New York City, of course, uh, is a city of immigration, uh, always had ethnic neighborhoods. Uh, my grandparents were Irish and German, and there were Irish and German neighborhoods, and there were Italian and Polish neighborhoods and black neighborhoods. Uh, many, uh, and of course, New York City has changed a lot. Many of the children of those ethnic groups uh, got educated. Uh, they became less, uh, they, they, were in, they were integrated more into the American culture and they moved away out of those ethnic communities. They, they moved to the suburbs for, for the big house and, uh, and the, Ameri the American dream. And what happened was new immigrant groups, many from Asia and Africa, uh, have begun replacing them and they're filling up those neighborhoods. So consequently, you have whole new ethnic neighborhoods, but they tend to, to cling more to the culture uh, of the society which they came for, from. They have restaurants that serve the kind of food that they like. That's a cultural thing. Uh, stores that sell the same type of clothing that they prefer. Uh, they'll, they'll be uh, re religious uh, institutions that are more adhered to the dominant religion of their society. These are all subcultural values, the food you eat, your religion, uh, the way you dress. Uh, so again, these would be subcultures within the major American subculture. Street gangs often have their own subculture. They have their own dress, their colors, the, the way they tattoos and what have you, their own special lingo or, 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 or phrases and terms. Uh, they are very isolated. They they they're secret, right? uh, and they have their accepted behaviors. You know, like engaging in criminal behavior. Uh, if somebody dishes you, you have to attack them. These are all subcultural values that are different than the dominant American value. Now, some people think that the police also have their own subculture, and that this subculture, its values, beliefs, and accepted behavior, expected behaviors, uh, influence the way cops perceive things the way they think about things, and most importantly, the way that they act. Now, the police subculture is supposedly characterized by cynicism about human nature. And when I say cynicism, I mean having a negative, jaded opinion of people and their motives. Uh, this is said to have developed in the police because they see the worst of people at the worst times in their lives. Uh, Another police subculture characteristic is supposedly a belief in the need for secrecy and not to rat or, or tell on other cops. This is the, uh, it's us against the world, uh, don't tell 
outsiders what goes on, protect each other, don't rat on each other. Even if a cop commits a crime, don't snitch on the cop. Uh, in addition, isolation caused by only associating with other cops. Uh, because they tend to be isolated and because they tend to think the outside people don't understand them and, and don't like them that much and don't support them, they tend to hang out supposedly mostly with other cops, which by the way reinforces the subcultural values because uh, they each think and speak and interpret things the same way and that strengthens the belief in, in the whole group. A belief that the public does not uh, support or understand the police, that they're against us, it's us against the world. We're the blue centurions, the thin blue line between chaos and, uh, and a civil society. Uh, another characteristic, a belief that force must be used to maintain respect for the job in the face of disrespect. If somebody disrespects you, you must maintain respect for the job and yourself by using force to put them down very quickly. And finally, a belief that police must take charge in situations. When you get to the scene of a crime scene, an accident scene, whatever, you must immediately establish a take charge, authoritarian, I'm the boss, I'm controlling this attitude. So these are the supposed characteristics of the police subculture. Uh, now, it is said that the police subculture exists because veteran officers break in new officers by teaching them the subcultural values. This would begin in the police academy, and then it would go on as the new rookie cop is on the street teamed up with a veteran partner. In fact, it even gets worse with the veteran partner who might begin the association by saying, forget all that crap you learned in the police academy. This is the way the job really is. Uh, I heard that a lot when I, when I first got out of the academy. But they broke you into police subculture values in the academy. I remember we had a, uh, a lecture when I was a recruit on the police use of force. And, and, and one of the rookie cops, one of my fellow rookie classmates said to the sergeant doing the instruction, well, what do you do if somebody, you know, faces you and goes, oh, karate, you know? Uh, and, and the sergeant took out a blackjack from his, black jock, uh, his back pocket whacked it on the podium and said, tell him karate this. A blackjack, by the way, is a deadly weapon. It is a, uh, a leather-covered spring with a piece of lead, also covered in lead, on the end. And if you pull, pull it up and whack somebody with it, the lead whips around and hits them in the head, and it's really very, very devastating. Uh, when I was a cop, everybody carried a blackjack because it was cool to be, you know, carry a blackjack, and it meant you were like one of the group. Right, subcultural, you know, uh, kind of behavior or expected behavior. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's one ex a reason for the subculture. Others say that the job attracts people who already who already possess those values. Now, before I became a cop, and even to a certain extent when I became a cop, and I became a cop in 1973. Uh, the police work was almost entirely white. When I came on the Port Authority Police, it was all male. The job title was police man, not police officer. And it was only around 1976, I'd been on about three years, when they admitted the first female police officers. And this was common around the country. So basically, your, your police departments were comprised of middle, middle and working class white males. And a lot of those subculture values, you know, tend to be... Uh, those values of that group. So that, that's part of it. Now, the police subculture is, do you think it's as strong today or not as strong today than it was in the 50s and 60s? Hmm. Well, it's not as strong today. And this is probably due to the diversification of the police force. In other words, more different, not just white, middle-class, working-class males. Today, you have more minorities, Hispanic and black in particular, still having a lot of trouble recruiting Asians for some reason. Uh, you have more women, and that's another big entry. They, they do tend to have a certain civilizing effect on males. Uh, and better educated officers. Starting in the late 1970s, uh, a, a federal commission that was trying to deal with police in their response to riots and, and, and civil rights issues uh, said that one of the things that the police had to do was to get more better educated police. And there was a big trend. That's when criminal justice departments and colleges were funded by the federal government. Cops were paid to get education. Departments began saying you have to have at least an associate degree to get promoted. 
So a lot of education, uh, higher education, uh, came into police work. And that has also reduced the subculture because uh, education, of course, you know, teaches how wrong those subculture values are, racial discrimination and using force to maintain respect as opposed to to protect yourself or somebody else, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not as strong today. Now let's talk about police corruption. Police officers wield great power and exercise considerable discretion. We've already discussed that. And power and discretion together create a great potential for corruption. Because when you have power over people and you have a lot of discretion as to act or not act, you can arrest them or not arrest them, uh, it's a lot easier to extort money from them. It's a lot easier to brutalize them. People tend to believe police over citizens. So they can use excessive force and say and lie and say it was okay. So, and by corruption, we're talking about behavior which deviates considerably from ethical standards, and it includes acts such as the unlawful use of force. Police officers are only allowed to use force. The, they have to use the minimal amount of force necessary to accomplish their goal. And the goal might be to subdue somebody to arrest them. It might be to protect somebody who's being attacked. It might be to protect themselves from being attacked. When police use more than the proper amount of force necessary to achieve those ends, then the police no longer have the legal justification to use force, and they would be guilty of any crimes the force created. So if they injured somebody, they'd be guilty of assault. If they killed somebody, they'd be guilty of a homicide offense. Another example of corruption is violating people's civil rights by acts such as unlawful searches and seizures. Uh, that's corruption. That's violating people's basic uh, right to be secure in their purses, persons, places, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. That's a totalitarian government behavior, which we certainly don't want. Theft. Uh, you know, police can steal. Uh, I'll give you an example. I mean, uh, in New York, in New York, uh, or most jurisdictions, if somebody dies in a, in a home or even a public place, the police officer has to guard the body until it's secured by the medical examiner. Uh, sometimes the police officer is alone with that body. So, uh, you know, if there's money or cash in, uh, in the house where the body is or elsewhere, the cops sometimes steal it. Cops have been caught stealing large amounts of money and drugs from drug dealers and then reselling the drugs. So theft is certainly something which corrupt cops can very easily do. Perjury. Uh, lying in court to cover up illegal searches and seizures or excessive uses of force. Bribe receiving. People uh, can, might offer cops money not to enforce the law against them, or if they committed a crime, not to arrest them. That's taking a bribe. That's a felony. That's very serious. And taking substantial gratuities. You know, the store owner gives you $200 for Christmas. That's not because he's your friend or she's your friend. That's because they expect a quid pro quo. This, the 200 bucks, and the that is, you don't hassle me for violations for litter in my store. You don't bother customers that double park in front of my store and run in to purchase my goods. The, the, the quid pro quo. Right. So those are examples of corruption. Now, questionable acts which fall short of corruption, but may also be unethical, uh, include taking minor gratuities like a free cup of coffee or not ticketing other cops or friends. Uh, most people don't consider this corruption. Um, a lot of times the free cup of coffee is a social situation with somebody the cop knows, a store owner on the beat. Maybe they're talking about, you know, what's happening in the community in terms of crime or, or problems. So the free cup of coffee is, is questionable. A lot of departments look the other way. But if you do become a cop, make sure you know what your department's policy is. Because some departments don't tolerate that at all. And you wouldn't want to lose your job real quick. Um, not taking other cops, that's something which, quite frankly, is a quid pro quo. It's not right, uh, but it happens a lot. Uh, or, and, or not taking friends or family members. Uh, I, you know, technically that's also unethical, but I don't think anybody would really consider it corrupt if you pulled over a speeder and it was your mother and you gave her a pass. Because the social harm from summonsing friends and, and family members uh, it is far greater than the fact that you're going to cut them a break and you're not dispensing law equally. Now, I'm talking about, you know, something like a speeding ticket. You know, obviously, you don't give your family a pass on murder or something like that. No more serious crimes. 
Some people believe that many very corrupt cops started down the slippery slope to corruption by taking minor gratuities. Uh, the slippery slope actually is a logical fallacy. Uh, it basically means if we give an inch, eventually somebody will take a yard, or if, if they go an inch, they'll eventually take a yard. So you start with a free cup of coffee. Before you know it, you're taking you know a few bucks to look the other way on a, on a parking violation, and before you know it, you're stealing money from drug dealers. I don't think that's true. Uh, most cops take you know the free cup of coffee, and they're not you know ripping off drug dealers. So I think it is uh, a, a fallacy. I think crooked people are crooked and they'll both take the free coffee and they'll steal, you know, a kilo of cocaine from somebody they lock up. Now, some people say that low pay is a reason for police corruption, but New York City cops are well paid and they have experienced numerous scandals. Uh, in fact, uh, go to uh, one of the online movie streaming uh, series and watch the movie Serpico. That's uh, uh, based on the true story of a New York City cop called Serpico who did not want to take the minor gratuities uh, that were being given out in this police precinct and even the not so minor gratuities. Uh, and the way they persecuted him uh, and the way he eventually uh, uncovered massive corruption in the New York City Police Department. Uh, and there have been, almost every 10 years since the 1970s of Serpico, there have been, or 60s of Serpico, there have been major corruption scandals in the New York City Police Department, but they're very highly paid officers. Besides, no city can pay their officers anywhere near what drug dealers can offer as bribes. So how do you combat corruption? Well, first would be to hire people of good character, and that's why extensive background checks are done, checks of your criminal record, talking to prior employers, prior neighbors, your neighbors. Uh, you want to get people who are good uh, and, and not somebody who's already had issues and problems. And of course, training in ethics. The police academy and continuing education has to talk about what is ethical, what is not ethical, what can you do, what can't you do, and what should you do when you see people doing what they shouldn't be doing. Uh, peer support for good behavior. Uh, towards the end of the movie Serpico, you will see the testimony uh, of uh, of uh, Serpico, uh, who was a detective at that time, no longer a detective, he got on a disability pension because he was shot under questionable circumstances, possibly with the, with, with the involvement of other officers who didn't like him. But he basically said, we have to have a job where the cop, you know, the good cop you know, isn't afraid of, of turning in bad cops, isn't the one who becomes ostracized. So you have to have peer support for good behavior. When cops turn in crooked cops, they shouldn't be called rats and ostracized. They should be supported and, and told that they're good. The prosecution of corrupt cops is very important. Uh, swift, certain, and severe punishment is one way to deal with, with serious corruption problems. And finally, drug testing. So much of corruption in police work is tied to cops starting to use drugs, and that's really quite a tragedy. Cops have easy access to drugs because you lock people up who have drugs all the time. Uh, undercover cops may be involved in undercover and major drug operations, where sometimes they have to take drugs to, to maintain their cover, which is a very controversial area I won't go into deep depth on. But it's possible that cops can become addicted to drugs, and it's all downhill from there. Uh, one of the cops who I came on with uh, as a rookie, who I worked with uh, on, on, on uniform patrol, and when I was a detective sergeant, he was plain clothes. Uh, he was doing a lot of drug arrests. We were doing drug interdiction, where we were interdicting drug couriers, bringing in and uh, bringing in cash to buy large quantities of drugs to transport back to upstate cities. And we were doing interdiction on the buses, and we were seizing major quantities of cash and drugs. Uh, and we were doing a lot of street buys and, and getting small quantities of, of drugs. And one day he made the mistake of, of sampling uh, one of those drugs, uh, and he became hooked on crack cocaine. And he very quickly spiraled downward, you know, late for work, uh, irritable. Uh, his physical appearance began to deteriorate. Uh, eventually, uh, he was suspended. Uh, he got to the point where he sold his service revolver on the street to get money to buy drugs. And, and he also held up a cab driver uh, to get money to buy drugs. And he was eventually fired. Um, I, I think he was prosecuted. About Seven or eight years later, I saw his partner and I said, hey, I said, whatever happened to Lou? And he said, oh, he said, I got a call from him about a year ago. And he asked me if I could drive him to his mother's house. And he gave me this location in Queens. Uh, 
South Road and Union Hall Street, which I was familiar with because in college I drove a hospital, uh, an ambulance for Jamaica Hospital, and we covered that area. And that is a horrible ghetto neighborhood. And when his partner pulled up to the intersection, there was Lou and, and some, 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 some crack whore prostitute living in a, an abandoned car in a lot. And they got out and they got into Lou's car and he was going to drive them to, uh, to Lou's mother's house in New Jersey. And as they were driving across Manhattan to get to the George Washington Bridge, like Lou suddenly rolls the window down and begins cursing at a New York City Mark Patrol car next to them because his mind was going to, which of course pulled over the car and, and his old partner who was still a cop had to show his tin and explain what was going on. They let him go. He dropped off Lou at the mother's house and who knows, sometimes coming back from drugs is, is a very difficult task. So, uh, so cops are drug tested when they first come on the job and cops who are in details uh, where there's a high risk of, of using drugs can also be drug tested. Uh, other than that, the Fourth Amendment prohibits uh, uh, random drug testing of police officers uh, who are not involved in details where they're exposed to drugs, because that's the Fourth Amendment. That's an unreasonable search and seizure. The dangers of police work. While police work is dangerous, not that many police officers are killed in the line of duty, and even less are feloniously killed. Uh, in fact, of the uh, over 800,000 state and local police and the 70,000 federal agents employed in the U.S., only about 70 per year, thankfully, are, are, are killed. That number is low, thankfully, feloniously. That means by criminals, usually shot. And about another 100 to 110 are killed accidentally, very often uh, during vehicle stops. Uh, so it's not super dangerous compared to other occupations like coal miners. Uh, however, officers do risk contracting contagious diseases like hepatitis, TB, and even AIDS from exposure to infected body fluids like blood. And in addition, stress can cause disease and psychological problems in some officers. Stress is caused by danger, organizational causes, uh, uh, horrible shifts, shifts. Like when I first became a cop, we worked rotating shifts. We worked one week of midnights. Then we got off, we came back, we worked one week of days. Then we got off, we came back, we worked one week of four to twelves, which is very uh, stressful. Uh, other organizational causes might be a boss who's unreasonable and out to get you. It could be being passed over unjustly for promotion. So those are all stressful things. Uh, or organizational seeing horrible things, seeing you know children that have been murdered or abused. Uh, other causes of stress, personal problems, marital problems, illnesses. Perceptions of prison as getting off with inadequate punishment uh, can drive cops to get really disturbed. Uh, my most outrageous case in that area was uh, a young boy about oh, maybe 12 ran up to me on the street and said that a guy had been following him for about 15 blocks and was offering him money and candy to lie in bed with him. And uh, just down the block, he grabbed him and tried to drag him into a, a tenement hallway. So I, I went out with the kid and we were looking and I found the guy and I locked him up, uh, you know, for uh, attempted unlawful imprisonment, endangering the welfare of a minor, you know, a few other charges. Uh, when I got his rap sheet, his criminal record back the next day, because we print them and then you get the criminal record back, he had been previously arrested for endangering the welfare of a child. So this was a pedophile. And uh, we got to the arraignment and the DA and the defense attorney went up to the judge. They were talking. I was not up there. I was, you know, behind the bar, the, the railing. Uh, and all of a sudden they come back and they let him plead guilty to disorderly conduct with a $50 fine. That was the most outrageous case uh, I had in my entire police career. Um, and finally, uh, excessive overtime. Uh, some people have, are forced to work a lot of extra hours, which can be stressful. I was actually the reverse. I, I like the money. You get time and a half uh, back where I was for overtime. So I used to work phenomenal amounts of overtime to make the extra cash. You know, we were building a house and money buys nice toys. Uh, so in fact, in fact, one year I worked uh, over 1,200 hours overtime. Uh, that was not stressful, but uh, tiring, but very profitable. Uh, and finally, dealing with misery and negative situations, like I said, you know, dead children, uh, overdose people dying, uh, locking up people in, you know, kind of degenerate situations, you know, prostitutes who are all diseased. Uh, you know, you see a lot of real misery if you work in certain details or certain parts of, of uh, the city or whatever municipality or county you work in. So 
Well, hey, on that pleasant note, that's the end of Lesson 6, Part 1. And now you can go on to Lesson 6, Part 2.